No trial provides a better basis for understanding the nature and causes of evil than do the war crime trials in Nuremberg from 1945 to 1949. Those who come to the trials expecting to find sadistic monsters are generally disappointed. Yes, there are some thoroughly despicable people among the hundreds tried at Nuremberg. But what is shocking about Nuremberg is the ordinariness of many of the defendants, men who might have been good fathers and kind to animals, yet who committed unspeakable crimes. Most of the Nazi defendants never aspired to be villains. Rather, they over-identified with the, an ideological cause. They focused too exclusively on career advancement, or they suffered a lack of imagination or empathy. What they generally did share was an inability to fully appreciate the human consequences of their decisions. 12 sets of trials comprise the Nuremberg trials. By far, the most attention has been focused on the first Nuremberg trial of 22 defendants, and with good reason. It was the trial that started it all and set precedents for the judges in the subsequent trials to follow. Scholars often refer to the first trial as the trial of the major war criminals, and it will be the focus of this lecture. Yet, we should note that there were 12 subsequent Nuremberg trials, some of those trials involve conduct no less troubling. The issues at least as interesting as the major war criminals trial. For example, consider the judges trial. The 16 defendants were German judges and officials of the Reich ministry who enforced the immoral laws of the Third Reich. Should they bear criminal responsibility for, as many of the defendants themselves claimed, just following the law? The judges trial inspired the classic movie judgment at Nuremberg. Or take the doctor's trial, in which the fate of 23 Nazi physicians hung in the balance. Physicians who performed horrific medical studies on German civilians and on nationals of other countries. Or consider the Einsatzgruppen trial, a real stomach to it. Judges in that trial ruled in cases involving 24 members of a mobile killing unit who murdered POWs and civilians in occupied countries. But let's step back and examine the context of that first Nuremberg trial. As World War II drew to a close, the question of what to do with the captured Nazi leaders perplexed Allied leaders. Roosevelt supported his War Department's plan to hold trials. Other leaders had their own ideas. Churchill is reported to have told Stalin that he favored the execution of captured Nazi leaders. Stalin is said to have answered, in the Soviet Union, we never execute anyone without a trial. According to the story, Churchill agreed, of course, of course, we should give them a trial first. The final decision came in Yalta in February 1945. The three Allied leaders issued a statement called, calling for some sort of judicial process for the Nazis. Two months after Yalta and two weeks after the sudden death of President Roosevelt, Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson received a visitor at his home in Washington. The visitor came to ask Jackson, on behalf of President Truman, to become the chief prosecutor for the United States at a war crimes trial. The trial would be held somewhere in Europe shortly after the war ended. Truman wanted a respected figure to represent the United States, a man of unquestioned integrity and a first-rate public speaker. Justice Jackson was all of those things and more. Jackson accepted the appointment, but many questions remain. Who would Justice Jackson prosecute? Where? And under what authority? In the last days of the war in Europe, several Nazi leaders chose suicide over trial and punishment. Two days before Justice Jackson's appointment as chief prosecutor, in a bunker 20 feet below the Berlin sewer system, Adolf Hitler shot himself. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels shot himself in a garden. Heinrich Himmler, perhaps the most terrifying figure in the Nazi regime, 
took a cyanide crystal while being examined by a British doctor after his capture and died 15 minutes later. Even without those big three, there were many important Nazi leaders who did fall into Allied hands, either through surrender or capture. Deputy Fuhrer Rudolf Hess had been held in England since 1941 when he parachuted into the Scottish sky in a solo effort to convince British leaders to make peace with the Nazi government. Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering surrendered to Americans on May 6, 1945. He spent his first evening in captivity happily drinking and singing with American officers. Hans Frank, the Jew butcher of Krakow, got less gentlemanly treatment. American soldiers in Bavaria forced Frank to run through a 70-foot line of soldiers. The soldiers kicked and punched him the whole way through. On May 23rd, a large batch of war criminals were rounded up in Flensburg, site of the last Nazi government. The Flensburg group included Karl Dunitz, Hitler's successor as Fuhrer, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, Nazi Party philosopher Alfred Rosenberg, General Alfred Jodl, and Armaments Minister Albert Speer. On June 26, Robert Jackson flew to London to meet with the delegates from the other three Allied powers. Jackson defended the notion of prosecuting the Nazis against objections that a tribunal would be applying ex post facto laws or that it lacked jurisdiction over German citizens. Jackson told negotiators from the other nations, what we propose is to punish acts which have been regarded as criminal since the time of Cain and have been so written in every civilized code. Jackson succeeded in convincing Allied representatives, but the whole notion of a trial didn't sit well with some fellow members of the U.S. Supreme Court. Just as William O. Douglas complained that the Allies were guilty of substituting power for principle at Nuremberg. He argued that the law was created after the fact to suit the passion and clamor of the times. Chief Justice Harlan Stone was even blunter, calling the Nuremberg trials a fraud in a high-grade lynching party. Stone added, I don't mind what Jackson does to the Nazis, but I hate to see his pretense that he is running a court and proceeding according to common law. Negotiators in London agreed to call the trying court the International Military Tribunal. The IMT consisted of one primary and one alternate judge from each of the four nations, Britain, the Soviet Union, France, and the United States. It used the adversarial system preferred by the Americans and the British rather than the inquisitorial model was preferred by the French. Defenses based on superior orders were to be prohibited. Also disallowed was what, what might be called the you did it too defense. The Allies wanted nothing to happen at the trial that would prove embarrassing to their own military officers. Despite concerns about conditions in Germany, Jackson convinced negotiators that the war crimes trial should be held in Germany. Few German cities in 1945 had a standing courthouse in which a major trial could be held. One of the few cities that did was Nuremberg, site of Hitler's most spectacular rallies. It was also in Nuremberg that Nazi leaders proclaimed the infamous Nuremberg laws that stripped Jews of their basic property rights. Jackson liked the connection. The city was over 90% destroyed, but luckily, in addition to the Palace of Justice, the best hotel in town, the Grand Hotel, was spared. And the Grand Hotel served as an operating base for court officers and the world press. In August, representatives of the four allied nations signed the Charter of the International Military Tribunal, establishing the laws and the procedures that would govern the trials. Six days later, a cargo plane carrying most of the major war trial defendants landed in Nuremberg. Allied military personnel loaded the prisoners into ambulances and took them to secure cells in the Palace of Justice. With the November 20th opening trial date approaching, Nuremberg 
filled with visitors. A prosecutorial staff of over 600 Americans, plus additional hundreds from the three other powers, assembled. They began interviewing potential witnesses and identifying documents to introduce in the trial from among the 100,000 or so documents gathered after the war. German lawyers, some of them who themselves were Nazis, arrived to interview their clients and prepare for trial. Members of the world press moved into the Grand Hotel and filed background features on the upcoming trial. Nearly a thousand workers rushed to complete restoration of the Palace of Justice. On the opening day of the trial, the 21 indicted war trial defendants took their seats in the dock at the rear of the dark paneled room. A 22nd defendant, Martin Barman, was not in the dock. Unbeknownst to the tri tribunal, he was already dead and buried. The tribunal tried Borman in absentia. Behind the defendants stood six helmeted American sentries with their backs against the wall. The marshal shouted, attention, all rise. The tribunal will now enter. Judges from the four countries walked through a door and took their seats at the bench. Chief Judge Sir Geoffrey Lawrence of Britain wrapped his gavel. This trial, which is now to begin, said Lawrence, is unique in the annals of jurisprudence. The trial opened with the reading of the indictments, which included four counts. Count one, conspiracy to wage aggressive war, addresses crimes committed before the war began. Count two, waging an aggressive war, also called crimes against peace, address the undertaking of war in violation of international treaties and assurances. Count three, war crimes, addressed more traditional violations of laws of war, such as killing or the mistreatment of prisoners of war. And count four, crimes against humanity, address crimes committed against Jews, ethnic minorities, the physically and mentally disabled, civilians in occupied countries, and other persons. The greatest of these crimes of, against humanity was, of course, the mass murder of Jews in concentration camps, the so-called final solution. For an entire day, defendants listened as prosecutors read a detailed list of the crimes they were accused of committing. On the second day of trial, Justice Robert Jackson delivered an eloquent opening statement for the prosecution. Jackson told the court, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes power has ever paid to reason. The prosecution moved to show the Nazis waged an aggressive war. Obvious to us now, of course. Still, the process demanded legal proof. Prosecutors presented evidence of the unprovoked invasion of Austria. They followed this up over the weeks that followed, at least two weeks, with documentary evidence relating to the invasions of Czechoslovakia, Poland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Greece, Yugoslavia, and the Soviet Union. Documentary evidence had one big disadvantage. It was boring. Hour upon hour of various letters and other communications being read into the record caused the press to leave in droves that allies began to worry the excessive reliance on documentary evidence was undermining their goal of educating the public about the horrors inflicted by the Nazi regime. Prosecutors agreed that something must be done to enliven the proceedings. The solution? Rely more heavily on physical evidence and live witnesses. A second phase of the prosecution case aimed at proving the Nazis' use of slave labor in concentration camps. Some of the evidence introduced during this part of this prosecution was hard to stomach. For example, prosecutors introduced USA Exhibit Number 253. Exhibit 
Number 253 was tanned human tattooed skin from concentration camp victims, preserved for Ilse Koch, the wife of the commandant of Buchenwald. Mrs. Koch liked to have the flesh fashioned into lampshades and other household objects for her home. Prosecutors next introduced USA Exhibit Number 254, the fist-shaped shrunken head of an executed pole used by Koch as a paperweight. By late December, the prosecution began to introduce evidence to establish the criminality of various Nazi organizations, including the SS and the Gestapo. Some of this evidence brought cries and gasps from spectators. A British prosecutor seeking to establish the criminality of the SS read an affidavit from Dr. Sigmund Ratcher, a professor of medicine who performed experiments on inmates at Dachau concentration camp. The affidavit described an experiment conducted to determine what method to use to save German flyers pulled out of the freezing North Sea waters. The affidavit recounted that Rasher ordered inmates stripped naked and then thrown into tanks of freezing water. Chunks of ice were added, and workers repe repeatedly thrust thermometers into the rectums of unconscious inmates. Then the inmates were pulled from the tanks to see which of the four methods of warming might work best. Experimenters dropped most of the inmates into either tanks of hot water, warm water, or tepid water. One quarter of the inmates were placed next to the bodies of naked female inmates. The affidavit reported that rapid warming with hot water was determined to be the most effective means of revival. Ratcher stated in his affidavit, however, that most of the inmates used in the experiment went into convulsions and died. In January of 1946, a series of concentration camp victims testified about their experience. The testimony was powerful. It was heartbreaking. Spectators wiped away tears. One witness, a 33-year-old French woman, was taken from France by train to Auschwitz in 1942. The witness described the scene upon arrival at the concentration camp. She told how a Nazi orchestra played happy tunes as soldiers separated those destined for slave labor from those who would be gassed. She also testified about a night when she was awakened by horrible cries. The next day, she discovered the cause of the cries. We learned, she explained, that the Nazis had run out of gas and that children had to be hurled into furnaces alive. Near the end of the prosecution case in February 1946, Soviet prosecutors introduced a film entitled Documentary Evidence of the Atrocities of the German Fascist Invaders. The film consisted mostly of captured German footage. It showed Nazi atrocities accompanied by a Russian narration. In one scene, a boy was shown being shot because he refused to give his pet dove to an SS man. In another, naked women are forced into a ditch, then made to lie down as German soldiers, smiling for the camera, shoot them. The prosecution rested on, June, on March 6th. After 33 witnesses and hundreds of exhibits, no one could deny that crimes against humanity had been committed in Europe. Now, however, it was time for the defense attorneys to make their cases. The most anticipated moment of the trial came when Hermann Goering took his seat in the witness chair. Goering wore a gray uniform and yellow boots. His attorney, Otto Stammer, asked him whether the Nazi party had come to power through legal means. In a long answer, delivered without notes, Goering told the tale of the Nazi rise to power. He admitted, once we came to power, we were determined to hold it under all circumstances. Goering was an unrepentant witness. He evaded no questions. He offered no apologies. He described the concentration camps as necessary measures to preserve order. It was a question of removing danger, he said. Goering suggested that Nazi leadership principle, which concentrated all power in the Fuhrer, was the same principle on which the Catholic Church and the government of the USSR are both based. Commenting on Goering's performance in the witness box, 
Janet Flanner of The New Yorker described him as a brain without a conscience. The courtroom was packed on March 18th when Robert Jackson began his long-awaited cross-examination of Goering. Goering at first managed to deflect most of Jackson's intended blows. He provided lengthy answers that buttressed points he had made on direct examination, such as the fact that he had opposed plans to invade Russia. Members of the prosecution team worried that Goering was getting the better of Jackson. He had become the trial's brilliant villain. Only by the third day of the cross-examination did Jackson begin to score points. He asked Goering whether he signed a series of decrees aimed at Germany's Jews. He asked about decrees depriving Jews of the right to own businesses, about orders requiring Jews to surrender their gold and jewelry to the government, and about orders barring Jews from making claims for compensation for damage to their property caused by the government. Jackson gave Goering, who was trembling now at times, little opportunity to do more than admit the truth of Jackson's assertions. It took four months for defense lawyers for each of the Nazis to present their evidence. Most defendants took the stand themselves, trying to put their actions in as positive a light as possible. A number of the defendants claimed to know nothing about the existence of concentration camps or midnight killings. Typical among them was Joachim von Rippentrop. Rippentrop asked in cross-examination, are you saying that you did not know that concentration camps were being carried out on such an enormous scale? Rippentrop replied, I knew nothing about that. Prosecutors responded by displaying a map which showed several of the concentration camps located near one or the other of Rippentrop's many homes. While some defendants pleaded ignorance, others emphasized that they were merely following orders. Although the IMT's rules clearly disallowed the defense of superior orders, defendants raised the issue anyway in the hope that it might somehow affect the severity of their sentences, if not the question of their guilt. Some defense evidence boomeranged and actually strengthened the prosecution case. One such mistake occurred when the defense attorney for Ernst Kaltenbrunner called Colonel Rudolf Hess to the stand. Why the attorney called the former commandant of Auschwitz as a defense witness remains a mystery. The best guess is that he hoped that Hess's reveal, testimony, which revealed his very large role in the gassing of thousands of inmates, might make Colton Bruner's role seem somehow minor in comparison. But Hess's matter-of-fact account of mass execution using Zyklon B gas, sometimes killing as many as 10,000 inmates in a single day, left the courtroom stunned. A few of the defendants used their time on the witness stand to confess their mistakes, to apologize for their actions. Wilhelm Keitel testified that he regretted the military orders he gave, orders he acknowledged were contrary to accepted usages of war. Hans Frank, Nazis, governor of Poland answered yes to the question of whether he had ever participated in the annihilation of Jews. Frank testified, my conscience does not allow me to throw responsibility simply on minor people. A thousand years will pass and still Germany's guilt will not have been erased. Albert Speer, the minister of armaments, was the most willing of all of the defendants to accept blame. This war has brought an inconceivable catastrophe, Speer testified. Therefore, it is my unquestionable duty to assume my share of responsibility for the disaster of the German people. After Speer finished his testimony, the London Daily Telegraph called it, quote, a tremendous indictment which might well stand for the German people and posterity as the most important and dramatic event of the trial. As June ended, the last of the 21 defendants completed his testimony, and the defense rested. Just as Jackson delivered his closing argument before a packed courtroom, 
Jackson aimed shots at each of the defendants in turn, though he reserved his strongest attacks for Goering. In the dock, Goering, with perverse pride, kept account of the number of references made to him. Jackson concluded his summation with a passage from Shakespeare. These defendants now ask this tribunal to say that they are not guilty of planning, executing, or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this trial as bloodstained Gloucester stood before the body of his slain king. He begged the widow, as they beg of you, say I, not, I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say they were not slain but dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true as to say there had been no war, there had been no slain, there had been no crime. In the final stage of the long trial, each of the defendants had an opportunity to offer a final statement. Hermann Goering told the tribunal that the trial had been nothing more than an exercise of power by the victors of a war. Justice, Goering said, had nothing to do with this proceeding. Rudolf Hess ended his remarks by saying that it had been his pleasure to work under the greatest sun which my people produced in its thousand-year history. Some defendants offered apologies. Some wept, likely aware of their fate. Albert Speer warned about the dangers of a new and more destructive weapon and urged humanity to act to eliminate war once and for all. This trial must contribute to the prevention of wars in the future, Speer said. May God protect Germany and the culture of the West. On October 1, 1946, the defendants filed into the courtroom for the last time. Sir Jeffrey Lawrence told them that they must remain seated while he announced the verdicts. He began with Goering. The defendant, Hermann Goering, was the moving force for aggressive war, second only to Adolf Hitler. He directed Himmler and Heydrich to bring about a complete solution of the Jewish question. There was, the chief judge said, no mitigating evidence. Guilty on all four counts. Lawrence continued with the verdicts. In all, the court convicted 18 defendants on one or more count. Three defendants were found not guilty. The three acquitted defendants, however, did not have long to enjoy their victory. In a press room surrounded by reporters, they received from a German policeman warrants for their arrests. They would next be tried in German courts for violations of German law. Sentences were announced in the afternoon for the convicted defendants. Again, Lawrence began with Gehring. The International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Goering, without expression, turned and walked out of the courtroom. Chief Judge Lawrence also told 10 other defendants, including Ribbentrop and Kaltenbrunner, that they would die on a rope. Three defendants, including Rudolf Hess, got life sentences. Four others, including Albert Speer, received sentences ranging from 10 to 20 years. The trial had lasted 315 days. Over the next two weeks, the condemned men talked with their lawyers about their last ditch appeals to the Allied Control Council, which had the power to reduce or commute sentences. The Allied Control Council, after three hours of debate, rejected all appeals. On October 15th, the day before the scheduled executions, Goering sat at a small desk in a prison cell and wrote a note. To the Allied Control Council, I would have had no objection to being shot. However, I will not facilitate execution of Germany's Reich Marshal by hanging. For the sake of Germany, I cannot permit this. Moreover, I feel no moral obligations to submit to my enemy's punishment. For this reason, I have chosen to die like the great Hannibal. After finishing his note, Goering removed a smuggled cyanide pill and put it into his mouth. Minutes later, a guard saw Goering bring his arm to his face and make choking sounds. A doctor was called. The doctor arrived just in time to see Goering take his last breath. A few hours later, 
at 1.11 in the morning, Ribbentrop walked to the gallows constructed in the gymnasium of the Palace of Justice. Asked if he had any last words, he said, I wish peace to the world. A guard pulled a black hood down across his head and slipped a noose around his neck. A trapdoor opened. Two minutes later, the next in line, Field Marshal Keitel, stepped to the gallows. By 2.45 a.m., it was all over. We might ask today whether the trial of the major war criminals mattered. Did it change history in any significant way? Well, this and the subsequent trials at Nuremberg did one part of their intended job well. They provided thorough documentation of Nazi atrocities. Even now, the images and testimony that came out of Nuremberg retain their capacity to shock. Perhaps more importantly, the trials exposed many of the defendants for the criminals they were. Nuremberg denied to Nazi leaders the martyrdom in the eyes of the German public that they might have achieved otherwise. There are no statues in Germany commemorating Nazi war heroes. Today in Germany, school children are taught the truth about their country's dark past. This is no small thing. The trials also set a precedent for dealing with war crimes and crimes against humanity. The International Military Tribunal became a model for other tribunals. Among those were the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, which tried Japanese military and political leaders for war crimes in the Pacific Theater. The International Court of Justice in The Hague is also largely modeled on the IMT. Finally, the trials inspired work to prevent future atrocities. Efforts in this regard led to such measures as the 1948 United Nations Convention on Genocide. Despite these successes, Nuremberg failed to achieve the grandest dreams of those who advocated for the trials. Nuremberg did not succeed in ending wars of aggression, nor did Nuremberg put an end to genocide. Crimes against humanity are with us still.